for us, what's guided us is, you know, Acts 2, 36 through 47. And so we see the early gathering of the church. And so you've got people who've repented and believed, and you've got people that are praying together. They're sharing the gospel together. It's a regular part of their rhythm in their life. They're loving one another and serving each other's needs and worshiping together and sharing communion, sharing bread, and, you know, constantly remembering the Lord in that. They're giving, even sacrificially, to one another. They're devoted to the Word. And we see natural leaders come up. And that may even be a distinction for us where we see leaders as servants and not someone to lord over. It's always loving and relational. And a community that wants to get together, that's not forced to. And so they're even getting together much more often than we would think. And so using that as a loose ecclesiology, and I know it's a big word, but we think about, you know, what would church be? And I've heard that question asked by many famous people. You know, like if you just read the Bible, what would church be? And so we see that as a good start. My name's Steve. What's your name, bro? Juan. Juan, nice to meet you. And so we just ask people, when you look around the world, are there things that you know are, are wrong, that are broken? What would you say to that? There's a number of things that are broken. So when we decide to go our own way, when we get stuck in brokenness, none of us like to stay in brokenness. We try everything like drugs and alcohol. Would you admit like if you just abuse those, it leads you to more brokenness, right? Yeah. Yeah. And then some people try religion, and I don't know if you've ever experienced this. They might go to church or something like that, and they look around and they go, hey, these people's lives are still broken. they still messed up. Have you ever experienced anything like that? Yeah. And that keeps us in brokenness, but that's not what God wanted. So he sent his son down to earth to die on the cross and pay the penalty for us going our own way. And after three days, he rose from the dead. And if we make him the boss, we show he's boss when we turn from our own way and we trust in what he did on the cross. And that makes us new. Has there ever been a time as far as Jesus is concerned, that you've surrendered to him. So part of what compelled us to do this, a couple years ago, we were reading some research by the North American Mission Board in Barna, and they were looking at uh, the percentage of lostness, people who were far from God in the state of Florida, and they came up with a number of 89%. We looked at the death rate, and so in Florida, on average, about 192 to 200,000 people die per year. So when you start applying 89% of that, it really boils down to about 19 people an hour in the state of Florida. And so that just shocked us. And we started looking around our community and people that we knew, and we just realized we desperately got to get the news out. It compelled us to go out and to be a family that shared the gospel. But the need is so big that we knew it was going to take us not only practicing it ourselves, but encouraging and training and building up other leaders that they could go do the same until there was no place left. Thank you for this food and thank you for just having such a great day at school and thank you for this cold weather and thank you for this food. Amen. 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 Want somebody to pass me some bread?
<laughs> All right, who wants to do highs and lows? Who's going to start? My high was going out and sharing earlier today and getting the excursion all squared away. A low would be having the sniffles. Having what? Sniffles. Yeah. Sniffles. Oh, okay. My high. All the times I kissed your mama. <laughs> <laughs> and my low is all the times I loved your kids. You know what I'm doing? <laughs> now, is that my high and low every time? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> my husband and I, we have five children, and he was on staff at a Legacy Church, and we were exposed to No Place Left. Once we did that, we tried to do like bivocational, where he would do like the church staff thing, but we would be going out in the harvest and we would be sharing the gospel. And the more we did that, like my heart just like caught the vision like wow this is like amazing to see what god would do i mean it literally was like almost instant that we decided that we needed to pursue this and become full-time missionaries and even our kids i mean at the time our oldest was in middle school she was even like this is what our family needs to do so when you know your middle school kid comes and tells you that it's like okay maybe there is something to that so I've been on staff at a church for about 15 years, not one church, but a couple, but you know, we'd always leaned into discipleship and evangelism. And I think there's a pathway that the church knows. And a lot of it is draw people to the church. And as we got exposed to this work through No Place Left and some practitioners, the focus shifted to going out. And like we'd gone on mission trips and we'd done local evangelizing. This seemed to, to even go further and to create community amongst lostness for the glory of Christ, seeing people come to a saving knowledge of Christ, rapid obedience, and the authority to do the work of ministry. And in a healthy way, gathering in community and accountability and stewardship of leaders and how to serve one another. And like a family style atmosphere, it drew our family to it. So Jerry and Sissy Smith are, have been pioneers in a bivocational model, meaning that they do raise some support, but they don't, they, they use that support for ministry and how they make a living is been through the restaurant. And so they've turned the restaurant also to a place of ministry. And so they're intentionally praying and ministering and part of their outreach to the community, but then they use the space for church, a location that the community realizes, hey, we can not only go there to get served food and good food, uh, but that it's a place of ministry. Just a really healthy example of what the place left can be uh, when people decide to give their lives to this. It just kind of becomes a part of their everyday life. Tell me what you're you're seeing God do here at Mission Kitchen. Uh, yeah, uh, well, the kitchen is just it's just another tool that God has given us to move the gospel, to expand it, to uh, grow the church, and mm -hmm. uh, make disciples. We've really seen God do some really cool things mm -hmm. as far as um, equipping. Uh, it's a great opportunity to equip and to send out. Uh, this place is just an opportunity for us to work together as a family and make money, but also to make disciples at the same time. And also we use it as a as a chance to um, raise support and awareness. Every month we have a, a different nonprofit that we work with. So all of our customers all month long, they round their change up. Uh, so we get to raise awareness and financial support for the missionaries. It's the little faithful steps that add up to the big impact. Using that analogy of like a little, just rounding up the change. Like, man, like what if we just rounded up the change in our life with our time, our resources, our intentionality to share the gospel and make disciples. Mm -hmm. You guys are doing that and modeling that practically for people to where they can see like, hey, as we're going out, uh, that we're intentionally glorifying Jesus and making him known and not only proclaiming him, but inviting people to follow him. You do a really good job of that. Thanks. Yeah, and the, the other piece about the cafe and why it's, uh, I think God is using it is because it shows people that what church uh, correcting a false thought that the church is this building. Um, we can have church at the beach or in, in the cafe or in the home. Uh, people know that there's church here. 
it takes away some of those misconceptions of what church is and what we think it has to be yeah um based on our traditions uh and our upbringing and our cultures and uh because the the church uh goes beyond that looking forward to the four fields intensive this coming weekend glad we get to go do it as a family so what kind of things do you think we'll cover over there well uh, I know we're going to start with casting vision of what God has done from Genesis to Revelation. And then I would like for them to see and discover on their own from Scripture the pattern that Jesus used in His ministry and that was continued on in the apostles in the church. And we could build from this to what makes a healthy church, a healthy church gathering. And then even study from the epistles, problem solving. Like as we see problems, where do we get to? We go to the, the scripture and you know, asking the Holy Spirit to guide us with Christ as the, the head and the authority over the church. But equipping the leaders to solve problems. If we could leave with that, I think that would be helpful. Be good. talking about like the hierarchy of things for us the hierarchy is pointed down it's not so much of a general in authority it's more so who is the greatest servant mm -hmm. and it's not the ladder that you climb it's the grave that you crawl into like oh, dying to yourself mm -hmm. and so those are the people that we like the people are just they're literally dying and exhausting themselves so that others may succeed how do we steward them so I want that to be the nature of what you guys are doing. There's a freedom, there's a joy, and when you get together as leaders, there's a sense of adventure like, let's figure it out. Yeah. Oh great, we got another problem. Yeah. The problems you guys are having are, are because of God is blessing it. The problem of your containers being too full, there's some people sitting in networks right now going, I wish I had that problem. Yeah. You've got multitude of believers ready. Okay, so how do we steward this so that it multiplies? You know, we see in scripture that you know the one and others are, are really only accomplished in community. That's part of the reason why we, we started with Made to Multiply. It started out as a training. And so we did a couple trainings and we invited people to, hey, let us come model what church looks like in your home and you know with the vision that you guys would all do this. And so everyone was excited. You know, people are out sharing the gospel and eagerly inviting people to this community. They are committed to following Christ you know, building up and encouraging one another. Then you see amazing leaders like leading, you know, other gatherings in their homes and it's multiplying, which is what it was made to do. And so the Lord's really blessed it. And we're just thankful that we get to be a part of it. So someone might ask, like, who are these guys and why did we come out here today? These guys are leaders in a network of churches who are developing other leaders so that those leaders can engage lostness in new areas and new segments and new peoples. And so you've got people who are going after unreached people groups that are represented here. They identified 12 or any number of the 2.5 million in the Tampa St. Pete area. And so as we pour into them, strengthening and encouraging them, 
and guiding them along what we consider a biblical strategy with the four fields, five parts. We see them and what we're entrusting to them, that they're going to pass it along to their leaders and even develop more leaders to multiply so that they can fill the gaps and go after those places who have not yet been reached. I've known you as a father, I've known you as